Hey guys, so um, this is just me here goofing around and testing my new uh, climbing safety belt. Uh, but I thought for the sake of fun I could uh, make my VC video from this rather comfortable position. Uh, but uh, let's see how this goes. So I haven't done this for quite a long time. Uh, and there are all kind of reasons for that, uh, but uh, I will not bore you with those. Um, and uh, let's, uh, I say, let's get immediately to the musical part before I get all nauseous here. So um, first, uh, so I have a stack of records here that I've been listening to in the last two or three weeks. First, um, I have uh, kind of completed uh, my collection of uh, albums by the band Full Circle. Uh, this was their first album, self-titled. So Full, Full Circle is, was a mostly kind of late 80s uh, jazz fusion band. Um, the lineup was, I think most of them were kind of Scandinavian musicians. But uh, the band was generally, I think, New York City based. Um, love the music, wonderful, uh, kind of very accessible jazz funk, jazz fusion, very melodic, uh, a lot of flute playing. Always loved the cover. Um, so overall, this is a wonderful, uh, lovely debut. And uh, so I got, the, because they released three albums. So I was determined to get the others as well. This is their second album, Myth America. Um, I haven't listened to this yet because uh, I haven't opened the record because I received this one still sealed in its uh, sleeve. So uh, this is kind of cool. That doesn't happen a lot to me. Getting a album from the 80s, for example, still originally sealed. Um, yeah, and this was their third album, Secret Stories, uh, just following, uh, continuing uh, their quite uh, soft and melodic uh, jazz funk, jazz fusion style. Really nice music, uh, very accessible. If you kind of like uh, nice, playful jazz uh, from uh, kind of fusion sound of the late 80s, um, this is a... Uh, Quite a good band to choose. Um, I mean, their music could probably comp be compared with a band like Caldera, probably. So, what else do we got here? Yeah, I've been listening to Annette Peacock and her X Dreams album. Uh, so, this is an interesting record and quite, um, yeah, I would say it's a bit of uh, extravaganza. The music is generally based on two styles, blues rock and jazz. And uh, it combines both into a slightly experimental and whimsical, almost avant-gardistic sound. Um, there is something about it that maybe reminds you a little bit of uh, Frank Zappa, maybe. But um, certainly when I've been listening to this, uh, I felt like um, um, maybe few years later, Laurie Anderson was a little bit inspired or influenced by this record. Um, so a fascinating album. I don't like every track on this record, but it's certainly a very interesting endeavor. Um, of course, many people know Annette Peacock probably as the vocalist on the first album by Bruford. So, what else do we have here? Oh yes. This is uh, the new album by Brendan Perry uh, that uh, came out not long ago. I got this uh, limited edition on a, a rather interesting colorful vinyl. Uh, let me take this out for a second here. It's actually, actually this looks totally black for you right now. Because you have to hold it against the sun. And if you hold it against the sun uh, or something very bright, you start to realize that this is kind of a uh, dark green um, and uh, looks actually kind of nice. 
So, um, Brandon Perry's uh, new album is entirely dedicated to the Greek music of Rebetica or Rebetica, which is a sound that was popular in the cities like Thessaloniki or Athens, uh, I think around the 20s, early 30s of the 20th century, basically brought by um, Greek expatriates returning from the Turkey. Most of them have been kind of violently chased out of the country and arrived uh, back in Greece after generations. And what they brought with them was the habit to smoke hashish. And um, so they started to run these kind of rebetica uh, cafes, which are more like dens and more like sometimes just kind of holes in some cellar with a few tables and banks and uh, they had been listening to their own music there, the Rambetica music, uh, which is a kind of a sometimes described as a uh, kind of Greek type of blues. And um, so uh, Brandon Perry picked this whole uh, musical style up and created this album dedicated to this type of music uh, called Songs of disenchantment and uh, yeah, quite a fascinating unique record uh, obviously um, on the one hand uh, he is uh, quite truthfully adapting uh, original tunes from this place and era uh, on the other hand the entire music of course is kind of thrown uh, uh, into the Brandon Perry blender so uh, you get of course a music that has this kind of a uh, characteristic uh, Brandon Perry style. So very nice record, very interesting. Uh, I've already some uh, favorites here, uh, particularly a track called In the City's Hammam, uh, but also uh, probably another track called The Hash Den Owner. Um, so uh, interesting record. Yeah, I've been listening to this one. Uh, this is the Jean-Luc Ponty experience with the George Duke trio. This is a record that they did, I think, around 1969 uh, to 1970. Um, this is being regarded as one of uh, kind of the pioneering early day fusion records. Uh, with this nice gatefold cover with the two blokes. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's... Uh, it's still kind of rooted in very sort of a classical jazz uh, style, very acoustic, um, but at the same time uh, reaching out uh, into the future and certainly uh, pioneering uh, a musical direction that uh, would follow in the next years. So uh, that's Jean-Luc Ponty experience with the George Duke trio. Very nice uh, jazzy album some beautiful playing. So uh, the next album is kind of a double album but it was released as two records and uh, this is quite interesting and very fascinating. Um, before I was talking about the Brandon Perry album, so music from Greece, uh, this here will uh, turn us uh, towards um, the music of Turkey. Um, so this band is called Molars and uh, this is basically one of the great classic uh, Anatolian psychedelic rock bands of the, er of the late 60s basically and early 70s. But they existed uh, for all the time until now, over five decades uh, with changing band members of course. And um, these two records here are kind of interesting for a particular reason. So this was produced by Osman Murat Ertel, uh, the guy from Babazula. Babazula had recorded their own album uh, the same year and uh, this was a uh, recording for the Night Dreamer label. Now the Night Dreamer label is in the Netherlands and uh, what they do is the, they invite bands to basically record a live set in the studio uh, directly into a record master so uh, there is basically no 
post-production. Uh, there are no glass masters and stuff like that, so you basically get your uh, your original print record. And uh, so this is acoustically very interesting. It's quite a great sound. And uh, Babazula did the same thing a few months prior to that. Um, I, I had already shown that record. And uh, so he dragged these guys into the studio where they basically recorded a large portion of their of, of their songs. And um, yeah, this is how they sound now, basically. So it's, it's interesting music because uh, you don't... Uh, well, what I'm trying to say is that their music has quite changed during the 60s, 70s in the same sense as their, their lineup has changed. And um, this is kind of how they sound now. So you get a particular snapshot of this band uh, as it was in 2020. And uh, you get kind of the best of both worlds because on the one hand you get sort of this dynamic uh, playing of an entire band as it would be in a live set. On the other hand, you don't get the, let's say, acoustic disadvantages of a live set. It's all in a kind of a perfect studio setting. So um, one could make the argument that uh, Anatolian psychedelic rock uh, has never sounded so great like on these two records. Um, some really wonderful tracks. I mean, the music is quite, quite uh, diverse, I would say, simply because uh, they had such a kind of vast uh, catalog of songs to choose from. Um, so this is quite a wonderful kind of double album with uh, a music uh, from Istanbul by the band Molar, and uh, which by, I think translated basically means the Mongolians. Um, so, great record, two records actually, and uh, certainly, certainly something I would uh, recommend if you want to uh, dip your toe into the Anatolian psych rock world and uh, just look for someone that is quite accessible and at the same time uh, not too expensive and um, on top of the kind of acoustic game whatever that means. There's no real reason why I'm wearing a helmet here. So, <laughs> um, what next? Oh yes, I love this one. This is a wonderful record here. So this is an album by Louis Gasca, uh, for those who chant, uh, which was released, I think, 1970 or 1971. 1971 um, recorded the same year. So this is basically the same year when uh, Santana was recording their seminal album Caravanserai and uh, basically turning completely uh, into a fusion band. And um, the fascinating thing about this record, obviously, I mean, Louis Casca is a trumpet player, but uh, the interesting thing is that the entire band here is basically the Santana band. So uh, this was recorded more or less in the same period of time as Caravanserai. Um, There's only four songs on this album, so they're all pretty long and uh, um, quite quite uh, amazing kind of jazz fusion uh, music in parts, kind of channeling channeling Miles Davis, I would say. Um, Stanley Clark on bass, by the way. Um, so wonderful, lovely record. Uh, I totally enjoy it, uh, and uh, haven't listened to it for quite a while, and uh, uh, had a lot of fun with that. Um, yeah, so wonderful, wonderful record with an insane lineup uh, and uh, cool sound. Let me just open the the gatefold sleeve here. Louis Gasca. So. Yeah, what else? Oh, let me have a look here. Uh, first of all, let's get out of the seat here because honestly my feet are falling asleep. Uh, oh, that was nice, but it was also a bit of a test uh, to see just how long I can just hang around here and um, until it becomes really uncomfortable. So, uh, the next two albums, fascinating stuff, fascinating stuff.
So um, some of you may have noticed, but uh, Big Star 1000 is back, uh, putting out new VC-oriented videos, which uh, is of course uh, great news. And um, so one of his videos a few weeks ago, I picked up on two records that I had to acquire. Hey guys, so um, I have changed the location as well. Um, so now we can continue. So as I said before, um, I had uh, watched a video by Big Star 1000 and saw two records that kind of uh, immediately grabbed my attention and I sampled them a little bit and uh, realized that I really want to have them. So I acquired both and uh, I'm really happy with those two records, uh, quite fascinating stuff. So first of all, this one is from 1980 and uh, is by an outfit called Fabiano Orchestra called Butterfly Island. Um, so um, this is a very kind of Latin rock oriented uh, jazz fusion album with a lot of Caribbean uh, elements. So this project is from Guadeloupe um, and um, J.F. Fabiano, the band uh, founder or leader, is uh, the band's drummer. Now the lineup is pretty hilarious uh, as far as uh, the quantity of musicians go. Uh, as you can all see them here <laughs> in the gatefold. Um, yeah, the music is wonderful. Um, they are certainly not trying to reinvent the wheel with their music. Uh, um, it's uh, in parts uh, a little bit like a kind of library music record, uh, but at the same time there's always a little more to the music um, and it's actually quite versatile because on the one hand you have a rather kind of cool uh, cool jazz compositions here and uh, then again some uh, kind of a solo oriented fusion tracks uh, while a lot of the songs uh, kind of reflect um, I think the basically the the music of this region so it's in parts very creole very caribbean uh, with a lot of interesting percussive elements and uh, even some steel drum playing as you would expect. Uh, so I immediately fell in love with this with this record. Um, so that's why I had to have had to get it. Um, this is a ratio that came out a few years ago and that's already out of print. Um, so um, it's not entirely easy to acquire this uh, album. Um, I had to order it from Portugal. Uh, which is not as crazy as it sounds if you live in Europe. Um, it's certainly much cheaper, the postage, than to order something, uh, let's say, from the USA or from Australia or from Japan. So uh, it wasn't that bad, um, but uh, I just had to have it. And the other album um, that I got from a Big Star 1000 video uh, I like even more. And that's a Japanese production called Hizuru. Uh, this is fascinating. This is so fascinating. This is a uh, blend of uh, of uh, jazz and traditional Japanese music. Um, so the instrumentation is very interesting because you have on the one hand all acoustic uh, jazz instrumentation with uh, an upright double bass and piano and jazz drumming. But on the other hand, you have um, a shamisen, a shakuhachi, you have koto, uh, you have uh, sort of Japanese uh, percussions uh, happening here, and it blends quite wonderfully. Now, interestingly, um, it is uh, there is kind of a third musical component in this music, uh, which is more like an inspiration from uh, kind of a European or North European classical music to some extent. Um, so it's not only jazz and Japanese folk music, which in itself alone would be quite interesting. And it gels beautifully, actually. Uh, it doesn't sound like uh, something that uh, is just whimsical, but uh, it's it's this kind of sound sound that they had refined for quite a while, probably because uh, it's like a marriage made in heaven. But again, there is this kind of a third component to it, which um, actually doesn't sound particularly jazzy and seems to me more like a kind of a classical, almost like North European or a kind of Scandinavian influence. 
Actually, there are a few moments where the music could probably be compared with Dead Can Dance. Um, but um, surely take this uh, with a grain of salt when I say that. Um, overall, it's a wonderful, wonderful music and uh, I've been listening to it quite a lot in the last weeks. So. Now, at the beginning of uh, this video, I had just told you that I was really not able or capable to make uh, YouTube videos for quite a while. So my channel is a little bit um, abandoned. I just couldn't do creative stuff uh, or anything uh, that's kind of productive. Uh, uh, it had a lot to do with my father, so my wife and I were taking care of him for we're in the third year now. But um, his his dementia is so pretty advanced that at this point we are quite uh, uh, intensely looking for a home. We're going to care home because uh, in a in this type of uh, progressing uh, Alzheimer type of dementia, there comes a point where you just need to realize that you are in over your head, that uh, there is just a point where you need to just stop and just uh, leave it to the professionals. Because uh, at a certain point, and this is what's been going on here for the last three or four months, just everything is just rotating around this one guy who's slowly descending into darkness uh, and um, it's not pleasant um, probably a little formative um, I certainly would not recommend this to everyone <laughs> it's not an experience people should seek um, but anyway it's just the reason why I have not done much but um, I was not entirely um, I just I just I didn't I didn't have the nerves just to, to deal with cameras and talking into a camera and 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 uh, doing just stuff and producing etc um so but uh, I was not entirely without any activity in that department so because I just started to get warm with this idea to make my own uh, favorite 100 or favorite 200 albums of my lifetime because I've seen it done um uh, Jeff from Calico Silva did a wonderful whole series uh, where he went through his favorite 100 albums. Other people did like 200 albums, 250 albums. Uh, uh, so I always wanted to do that, but it's actually a bit of a chore. I mean, you really have to just... Uh, uh, particularly for me, it's not something that I can just write down. So this, there was a list and then, of course, it took me weeks and weeks to kind of refine this list and throw things out put new things but the reason why I'm telling you this is that um, of course I cheated a little bit because I took these two albums and put them in my best of 200 albums of all time list uh, which is a bit of a bit of a cheeky bit cheeky because uh, usually you would expect if someone makes a kind of a my favorite hundred albums of all times that uh, those are all albums that the person had known for years or even decades and uh, this is obviously not the case with these two records but on the other hand have you not experienced in your lifetime have you, have you ever encountered this one couple that falls in love and three weeks later they are already married uh, in some uh, roadside chapel probably and everybody's kind of uh, shrugging and shaking their heads and hey it's just what happens and um, sometimes you just fall in love with music and you just think okay this is this has definitely be this needs to be in my top 200 list despite the fact that you've only known it for a few weeks so um, that's my explanation here now the next one is a kind of odd one this is the album land of cocaine by self machine um, I had to get this one, of course, because Alan Holdsworth is on it and uh, sooner or later I will own any record, every record <laughs> where Alan Holdsworth had played on. Um, he obviously uh, participated uh, like five, six years prior to that uh, on the Soft Machine album Bundles, which is vastly superior to this one, no doubt about that, uh, which is a masterpiece and another record that i have in my uh, top 200 uh, but uh, in a very good conscience but um i just always i would <coughs> excuse me i always wanted to hear this one 
it's actually not bad it's great fun it's a bit eclectic um obviously uh the band uh, was uh, kind of uh, past their prime at this point and uh Carl Jenkins was already deep sort of into his orchestral work so this certainly shows on this record uh, so it's a bit of a hodgepodge of uh, quite different tracks uh, that stylistically don't seem to belong that much together but on the other hand um, I have really I have really no grievance with this album it's just kind of beautiful beautiful listen uh, kind of uh, effort to by the way interestingly just uh, because this is not the only band that went this direction it's it's almost sounds like soft machine are trying suddenly to sound like the Alan Parsons project and uh, this is a sentence I have actually heard before because uh, if you look at the wonderful band Camel uh, it's always seemed to me like in the very late 70s and early 80s they tried to sound like uh, the Alan Parsons project probably because 78, 79, 80, 81 was really a time when Alan Parsons project was incredibly successful without touring, without making live concerts, just making a one studio album per year. Um, so everybody from this kind of a sophisticated prog rock, uh, jazz rock uh, scene probably thought, well, before we became become completely obsolete and total dinosaurs, what if we tried this uh, kind of a style? Um, so yeah, um, truth truth to be told, they of course never achieve it. Uh, they never really sound like the Alan Parsons project, but um, it's not a bad direction to go, generally speaking. So what you get is kind of a jazzy, very sophisticated pop music, um, but uh, at the same time, a little whimsical, little playful here and there, and um, I have no problem with this record. It's probably not one that I would want to listen all the time, um, but um, it's a really wonderful album to listen to on a Sunday afternoon, for example, while having a tea. It's a good record. And uh, I have no idea why uh, Land of the Cocaine is this album's title. I'm pretty sure there's some story behind it. Of course, cocaine intentionally misspelled. Um, so um, yeah, so this is an example of uh, kind of Soft Machine's later work. Um, still with Alan Holdsworth on board as a session guitarist. Uh, he's not very prominent. You can hear him playing his kind of legato style solo uh, on a couple of tracks, uh, but I'm pretty sure he's not on every song on this album. So um, I've been listening to the new Tony Williams Lifetime which was this kind of wonderful uh, reinvention of uh, Tony Williams in the mid 70s again with Alan Holdsworth on guitar it's a great lineup you have the, you have Alan Pasco on keyboards and uh, of course Tony Newton on uh, bass and uh, this is a wonderful record it includes even uh, compositions by Alan Holdsworth um, I think in many interviews um, this was like his first big uh, kind of a uh, gig in the prog rock fusion uh, world uh, and uh, he always I think spoke very favorably about those uh, short uh, two maybe three years with uh, Tony Williams um, he even contributed a couple of songs here uh, mostly with uh, the title of the tracks are mostly with some Star Trek reference. <laughs> um, I have actually only one thing that I find a little odd with this album, but uh, it would be kind of interesting because I know there is some kind of remaster version of this, and it would be interesting to listen to it if it's different. It's I find it stylist uh, acoustically. I find it um, very. Um, the way it is mixed down as a stereo mix is very old-fashioned and it sounds actually like something mixed down in 1966 or 67 in those days when companies like Derham experimented with stereo for the first time and you have some famous uh, kind of seven inches from those days when where um, for our modern ears uh, the, the stereo mix down sounds a little awkward like having the drums deep in the right channel and the organ deep in the left channel and it 
you, you kind of hear that in those months, um, those uh, sound technicians kind of explored a new world, new world. Before that, everything was in mono and they kind of tried to figure out if people will like stereo and what it actually means and how it will sound, etc. Um, so it's, but this is an album from 1975 and um, it sounds strangely, I mean, I actually understand what, what's going on here because what, it feels to me like Tony Williams kind of tries to move all the instruments a little bit out of the way. So you hear, you hear um, Alan Holdsworth very deep in the right channel and Pasqua very deep in the left channel. So like in the middle is only Tony's drums and Newton's bass. And uh, this might have been intentional, kind of, it's his band and he wanted to, the drums to sound very prominent. But I find it almost a little annoying. Now I'm criticizing this now a lot, this is not such a big issue, this is really a wonderful record, I love this album. But uh, I always thought like if I really have too much time on my hand and have <laughs> nothing to do, I would digitize this album or just get some good uh, kind of WAV file from a CD. And uh, I would just throw it into a, a a kind of audio audio production software. There are tons of plugins where you can kind of manipulate the stereo sound and just just make the stereo less extreme. Just just to shift shift the uh, Holdsworth guitar a little closer to the center. Just a little, like twenty percent. But um, I'm already talking too much about it. But it's interesting because uh, their second album, um, Million dollar legs uh here they fixed it i mean it doesn't sound anything like the previous one as far as the mix down goes uh, the stereo sound here is very different yeah so this was a wonderful band i like both of these albums uh um and um this is quite a great milestone of uh jazz fusion and uh yeah wonderful wonderful record and uh kind of wonderful chapter in uh this uh fascinating career of Alan Holdsworth. So, um, and I have just one more album here uh, that I've been listening to and I've been listening to The Waking Hour by Dallas Carr. So this comes in a beautiful gatefold sleeve with a rather famous American painting by Maxfield Parrish. Um, I always wondered because there's a Moody Blues album that has a very kind of similar motif on the cover and an album that came probably one or two years after this and uh, I always thought that the Moody Blues did their cover as a kind of a pastiche uh, because they might not have gotten the the rights by kind of the parish estate or I don't know but I just think it's because uh, these guys did it like one year or two years prior to, before that and uh, so um, they just didn't want to have a record that looks exactly the same. So um, it's a famous, wonderful, kind of a romantic uh, American painting. I think uh, I could imagine the, the mountains or the rocks in the, the crack in the background. Maybe that's the Yosemite, who knows. Um, but I've known, this, I've known this painting for quite a long time, long before I knew this album here and um, I always like this kind of a naive romantic uh, style. It's very much kind of in the spirit of the pre-Raphaelites. And uh, but um, this album here, this album is quite insane. So um, this is basically a collaboration of uh, of uh, Mick Karn and the singer Peter Murphy. And uh, I mean, you, I guess you buy this album for one of two reasons. Either you are a fan of Murphy's uh, kind of signature type voice or you want to hear some incredible bass playing. Um, I mean, I'm saying nothing new here that uh, just Mick Karn is this incredible, incredible instrumentalist and great bass player. And this is a very kind of bass oriented album, but in a very unique 80s way. So this is a very kind of... Uh, dark wave oriented uh, style of playing and very fascinating i mean it's a it's a it's an unique album um that um, is probably one of the m most interesting records of the 80s i would say very very 
kind of brooding, very moody, uh, very unique in its sound and uh, with some incredible, incredible bass playing. If I ever made a kind of list of my top 10 uh, bass guitar performances, I probably would have to include something from here because uh, while this is a kind of a synth pop album, you could say, with a lot of kind of synthesizer sounds and a lot of kind of electro drumming, um, very much in the spirit of those kind of early 80s, um, it's heavily dominated by Karn's bass playing, uh, which is outstanding and very very rev revolutionary for that time i think uh, because i think like the 70s were kind of the bass player's time with you know, stan clark and uh jaco pastorius and all those big names um, so it was kind of interesting to make a kind of bass oriented album in the 80s and just to bring something entirely new to the table and uh, kind of create a completely new very kind of organic and very very smooth and very energetic uh, bass sound uh, that very much uh, kind of belongs into the 80s. So yeah, fascinating record. Uh, certainly something uh, that uh, I can um, recommend if you want to dwell, if you want to immerse yourself into a kind of very typical moody, uh, melancholic, uh, atmospheric 80s sound. Uh, of course, uh, with the with the wonderful voice by Peter Murphy. So that's it for now. Uh, I've been already talking far too long, but uh, I hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, and the next station on my road uh, here on my YouTube channel will most likely be my um, 200 favorite albums of all times video, which will not be as long as you probably think. Uh, because I don't want to be talk. I don't want to be talking about 200 albums. Um, this will be more like a fast spaceship crossing our solar system, and um, it's kind of interesting metaphor. <laughs> Let's stop the camera now.